I did have a boss, unfortunately, who created a culture of, you know, just fear and despair. And I could see the suffering, other people's suffering as well. Resources, you know, team members, individuals, if we are always fearful of making mistakes, we're not going to try something new. If organizations want to grow, if they want to innovate, they need to really think about leaders who encourage people to come up with new ideas, even fail. Tell your money. Welcome. Good to uh, finally talk to you. And you and I connected on LinkedIn, uh, and I related so much with your background. You have an impressive career in management consulting, but then also client success and pro services. You also held a VP of professional services role at Elevate SaaS. So again, you know, that, that just, I related with you, you know? <laughs> um, so good to have you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to be here, Diego. Um, thank you for inviting me. I think we've had some uh, really nice conversations. Um, I think we both have a lot, a lot in common. So really excited to be here and uh, you know, talk to you about things that, uh, those services and things that you feel so passionate about. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny you, you said passion because obviously I care about ROI. And mm -hmm. then some of our conversations had led that way and also about customer value. Um, so we're going to dive into that. But I do yeah. want to ask you a bit of an icebreaker. You game? Absolutely. Yep. All right, cool. <laughs> if you could put absolutely anything on a billboard, what would you put it and why? Okay. Um, so I would say your customer trust is the heart of your business. Strengthen your tr customer trust and um, your business will improve. Your customer trust is the heart of your business. Strengthen your customer trust and your business will improve. Customers might need to um, drivers might need to drive a little slow around that billboard, <laughs> but I love the message. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, very, and it's very focused on, on what we're going to talk about. I thought you were going to go like, you know, conventional homes suck. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to put on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we're talking about the. Uh, um, my Tatooine in the Catoctons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about, about the home you built and then we'll, we'll get into it. But I, I just think it's such a cool story. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you can see my necklace. Uh, it's a baby Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a diehard Star Wars fan. Um, my husband and I, we moved from California in 2021 and uh, we built a concrete dome home. And the easiest way to uh, describe it is um, an igloo, but made with concrete. And for any of the Star Wars fans out there, it's uh, Luke Skywalker's home. If you remember that, the Tatooine, that's basically what it is. And it's a um, highly energy efficient home. Um, if you're, uh, I mean, we, we just got like 10 inches of snow over the last uh, weekend and temperatures sometimes drop into the teens, but it just feels so warm inside. We have hydronic heating and, um, and it's really energy efficient because of the architecture. Um, but really the journey that I feel really, you know, and I think, you know, again, it comes, I'm using the word passion, is uh, the whole building something really uh, new that had never been done. We're, we're the only, Concrete Dome Home in the state of Maryland, not only the state of Maryland, but uh, other states around. Um, and just the learnings, the communicate, you know, it, it was a, it was really a cool project, but also had a lot of, um, a lot of difficult times that we went through mm. because of all the unknowns and the things that, you know, we had to come up with solution wise, the project. And it's, it's, uh, it's really cool. Did you step into a work culture that you found was already empathetic or was that a transformation? Hmm. Um, I've had places where empathy was absent and I've worked at places where it was 
part and parcel. It was a it was in the DNA of um, of that culture. Um, I think it really um, starts with the leaders. If a leader is in, um, focused on the people and uh, connects with the people at the human level, it just permeates naturally through the culture. Um, I consider a work culture really um, as a family, a family environment. If you have a dysfunction in the family, uh, everybody there, you know, like you have parents, you have children, you have siblings, all of their interaction is going to be impacted by the way that the, the leaders or the parents, in the case of a family, how they uh, interact and what kind of tone they create in that environment. So to, to answer your question, um, yeah, it depends on the leader and it depends on how, you know, the interaction that they have with the people. And, and what are the tactics to empathy? How do you make someone empathetic? Because that's such a deeply personal part of how someone is, you know, that's, yeah. uh, I think it's called a trait. Uh, so is it something, actually, let's start here. Let's take it a, a different way. Can anyone, anyone learn empathy or is it um, an innate trait, do you think? I think um, it starts with um, a desire to be empathetic. It starts with an openness from, for an individual to learn to be more empathetic or to learn empathy. Uh, and at that point, the journey to learn and become better begins. So to answer your question, um, for some people, it's innate because that's how they were from the very beginning. And if you've heard of the term empathic or more sensitive, because some people can really feel other people's feelings more than, than others. So yes, it comes uh, for some naturally. For some people, it, it comes naturally. For others, it may not be as natural. Um, so people who are natural, you know, empathetic uh, mm. people, they can teach that if they put their, you know, if they, if they think about, you know, what is what are some of the key behaviors and drivers. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who may be curious about it, want to be better, um, it can be taught. But there are others that I, I think you know, if if they're not interested in learning, you can't really mm. do anything with. <laughs> with so that. there, there's like three big cohorts. Then there's like <laughs> your your uh, people who are ready to go from the start, people who are teachable, and then not teachable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that last category really spoke to me. Um, do you have a story or a time where you've encountered that, like where you were trying the the tactics and and you couldn't reach someone on empathy? Oh, um, yeah, that's very rare to find people like that. But um, but yeah, I mean that I did have a boss, unfortunately, who created a culture of, um, you know, just fear and um, despair. Uh, I don't think I had the, I wasn't there to really teach empathy to my boss. However, um, just trying to deal with this person on a day-to-day -day basis just made it very difficult. And I could see the suffering, other people's suffering as well. Um, and because unfortunately this individual was in, you know, such a, a high position that really, you couldn't really have that kind of uh, frank conversation mm -hmm. or, you know, 
a conversation about, hey, this is not working. Um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, are in those positions. They shouldn't be. Why is that a problem, using fear and despair? Um, you cannot innovate when you're when you're uh, when you're fearful to speak out or to even come up with new ideas. And when there's no innovation, there's no growth. And uh, I think um, it's been. Uh, I know Google did a an ex, you know a project. I think it's called Aristotle, where they um, studied the culture, you know, like what were the key drivers for innovation. And the main, the most important driver was um, emotional safety. Mm. And if, if resources, you know, team members, um, individuals, if we are always fearful of making mistakes, we're not going to try something new. We're not going to, we're just going to constantly be focused on covering, you know, covering our, uh, our backs. So uh, if organizations want to grow, if they want to innovate, they need to really think about leaders who encourage people to come up, you know, uh, with new ideas, even fail. Because failing is the, you know, fertile ground for growth. If you don't fail, you don't learn. If you don't learn, you can't create something new. It's finding out where the boundaries are, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like emotional safety is required to have innovation. So it just sounds like if you don't have empathy, you don't have emotional safety, therefore no innovation. No innovation. Yeah. That's no a, growth, right? It's a major sacrifice for a business to make. And when you say growth, let's take it into uh, more of the the impact that these uh, culture and soft skills have on a business. You know, mm -hmm. you've you've led a team recently at Elevate SaaS, and al also just throughout your your impressive career. And what have you seen translate? In, how have you seen these things translate into real measurable impacts to the businesses? Oh yeah. Um... <laughs> So I'll give you an example. I know it um it'll date me a little bit, but um in my consulting career, uh we were working on um a solution that really had never been implemented before. Um and the thing is uh it it had to do with the Y2K. Right, so there you go. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's going to be a one-time thing. Uh, we need, and, and the date is not. You know, we cannot push the date. We need all the, every creative idea that we can uh, come up with. Right, so it really was a time when um, people from all parts of the world. You know, they were they really came together um to to build teams and really um put their heads together to solve this this problem and um uh i learned a lot about leadership in that um from that experience and um what my company i was at ernst and young at that time what my leader what she did is she uh put us all in a huge um, room. It wasn't just a conference room. They actually built uh, a space where I think there were about 30 of us. And she made sure that there were very few barriers, right? We could talk to each other. We could yell at each other across, you know, um, our short, uh, you know, walls. I could see the person in front of me, behind me. And what it did is it created a family environment. I mean, literally there were roles. Some of us took the role of a big brother, a big sister, right? A younger brother, younger sister, because the more experienced ones really were coaching and um, 
teaching some of their skills to the, the more junior consultants. And that was the relationship or that was the vision that our leader had. She wanted to not just have the more experienced um, developers do the job and move on. She wanted, she, she made sure that we were learning from the more experienced people. Um, and that really catapulted the, uh, the solutioning. I mean, we were able to come up with new scripts, new programs, uh, we were whiteboarding. I mean, it was just so amazing experience because of the uh, the human, you know, synergies that were um, created. And it wasn't like, there wasn't a lot of, hey, this is, it wasn't like a, a whole detailed out plan, right? That, that was created. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Next step, next step. No, it was hey, this is the right thing to do, let's do it. And then it just took its, you know, a life of its own. So that's really one example of it. Um, and I can I can give you more, you know, like just in the dot-com uh, space and that, that time period, there was just so much creative um, creativity going on that now today, if I talk about it, it's like, Wow, you were really at the cutting edge. I mean, we were talking about selling cars on the internet that had never been done before. Exactly. Right? That must and have sounded was... crazy to do, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So... And that's that's something that was encouraged, right? As as consultants, um, we were encouraged to come up with those harebrained ideas. Okay, what else can we do? What else can we do? Okay, let's try it out. And, um, you know, a lot of them failed. A lot of the solutions failed, but that was the the really the fertile ground. Like I said, the fertile ground for new creative solutions is failure. I love that, and I think what I'm hearing is that failure comes from having an emotional, emotionally safe place yes. to work. And then I love how you tied that to what the workspace looks like. Um, mm -hmm. I may butcher this, but I want to say it was Steve Jobs who had this big moment where he's like, no, we're not going to put Apple into multiple campuses. We're going to be in one freaking building. And yeah. I think it's it's moments like those, whether they're intentional or accidental, they have a massive impact on how a business looks and feels and, and, and feels to work at. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, for how much we've done and how far we've come on, on things like Zoom and remote technologies and all that, you got to ask yourself why, like, the world's biggest conferences from people who are like uh, online personalities and 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 all that are still in person. Yeah. Right. And I think that that is a testament to the power of of just human connection. And mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go off the rails for a second, and, and I would call myself a, a psychology enthusiast, right? I didn't I didn't <laughs> study it, but I I study it as a, as an enthusiast on a day to day perspective, not like. Um, uh, not not in college. So mm -hmm. I, I look at this and I think this this shows that there is something that happens in, to us and in our brains when we when we meet in person and when there's yeah. touch involved, when you can hear and feel the tonality and the presence of somebody in a room. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other uh, little nuances. And um, it, you know, I think it's it's all a product of our our whole biology, like doesn't need language like we create a language well into being people so that means we yeah. were people first and then and we were tribal people first and then we we uh figured out oh we should probably figure out some words to just agree on what things mean mm -hmm. so um no I, lo I love that and i and i've seen it firsthand too and I, I think you're spot on and um i want to uh use that as an opportunity to segue into you know how much words matter and how we can get things on the same page and um, take the conversation actually to ROI and specifically mm -hmm. what that means to you and what kind of ROI have you seen? So start with a basic definition, but then follow with like, what have you seen having these safe trust-based cultures? How, how have these been impacting businesses? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, return on investment, right? 
It's the is the lifeblood of any business. So I've seen the ROI plummet and I've seen it, you know, really exponentially increase. Um, and it all, I think the human interaction, how we work together as teams, how we interact with the customers, that really determines how um, your ROI is going to be, um, you know, whether it's going to be, uh, whether you're going to be successful or not, right? You can have a product, you can have a service, but if you don't have happy customers, especially in a SaaS based um, business, you're, you're really dead in the water, right? Because without a recurring um, um, annual recurring revenue, for a long period of time, you don't have you know a good ROI, um, and so so that's one of the learnings that I've had uh, from my experiences, not just more you know the recent um, work at Elevate, but even in the past. It's if the ARR or annual um, recurring um, revenue is the lifeblood of any SaaS. It's customer trust that is the heart, right? That keeps pumping that lifeblood into uh, your business. I love that. And how do you how do you measure that? And I mean the the customer trust. How do you know you have that? Um, I mean the the if you're looking for a, a concrete measure, it's the subscription, right? Are they are they continuously renewing your con, you know, the contract, right? Are they happy? Are they, um, if they're happy, they will continue to, um, you know, to renew. But also, are you helping them get better? Are they growing? Are they getting better? Right. So it becomes. A really a synergistic relationship. If you don't, if you have that, if they're growing and you're growing, right, and and that is elevating both of you, then I think you know that that is a good measure of, uh, you know, the customer trust. That's that's such a good point because we're basically saying, in my words, it, if we're not adding value. The subscription on its own isn't isn't the full picture, right? It's not the Be full picture, no. This reminds me of a case study. Tell me if you've heard this, but with Netflix, where they had uh, a number of people who were subscribing, and from a financial perspective, a customer who subscribes and doesn't use your services is like the highest ROI customer, right? Um, but from a human trust perspective, we know that if we're not adding value to them, mm -hmm. they're they're a liability. Yeah. And we're not helping them. We're just taking their money and not giving them exactly. anything for taking their money. So right. then um, what Netflix ends up doing at some point is telling these people, hey, if you don't use our services, we're going to cancel you. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and some people, I imagine, right? I think we can all guess what happened, right? Some people are like, oh, man, I could use Netflix. Let me start using it. And some people are like, oh, thanks, Netflix, for, mm -hmm. for not just doing taking right my thing. money. And and they what I like about that is that they're both virtuous cycles in terms of trust. And in both of those, it builds trust with someone. Correct. And I like to always look at these massive, like one to a million type of transactions as if you did that with one person in one room, one person that you knew. If you knew one, one again, a, a single person, and you were like, hey, here's a service I'm going to provide to you. It's 100 bucks a month. And then 20 months has gone by. Mm -hmm. You never reached out. They never use it. They're going to feel cheated, right? Exactly. And that's going to demolish trust now now amplify that times an audience of millions of people mm -hmm. and all of a sudden um that you can tip the the word of mouth a, a, a tide to yeah. from being in your favor to like no these guys just want money they're just exactly gonna scam you and um so i I'm, I'm i love that you highlighted that and uh i'm gonna take us back just a step to still on roi and really double down on are you using the strict definition 
of like the mathematical equation or are you using more of a um uh loose definition of what you get for what you put in and 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 they're both valid i use both of them yeah. but i just want to understand which which roi are we talking about here yeah i'm i'm talking about both because you can have the mathematical equation right and it's and the return on investment really is over a period of time you know what value in terms of revenue are you getting over a period of time right mm -hmm. so it's the it's the you know rate, um, return on investment rate of return whatever it is but um but at a higher level it is the value right you cannot place Sometimes you cannot place a dollar amount on the value that you created because trust, something like trust, something like a brand, it can it can be seen just in terms of um, the engagement, right? There are just so um, those are some of the elements that are that can translate into revenue in dollars signs, but you cannot, from the face of it, you cannot really define them in terms of uh, dollars, but they are the key driver. They're just so huge for potential future growth and the sustainability of an organization that um, you cannot just think about ROI in terms of the, uh, you know, numbers, the, the mathematical equations. Would that make sense? A hundred percent. So we've talked a lot about trusting your team, trust with your customers, mm -hmm. and how all that translates to ROI. So quick thought experiment. If we could measure trust just as a, as a thought experiment, and we max that out, like that's it. Like we can't have more trust with our employees. We can't have more trust with our customers. What's next? Like, what's the next vector in, in the context of delivering services in technology mm. companies that you need to focus? Is that all you need? Or are, in the with problem solution cycle thinking, what's the new problem that we introduced by having a very trusting team that now is the next challenge? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good, good question. Wow. So I'll go back to um, my foundational my, my foundation when I think about teams is um, family. When I think about even any kind of relationship, whether it's with a customer, with my team, right? So um, a good relationship is built on trust, right? So once you have that trust, what's next? Right? And I think the next, the next thing is to build something together, right? To create co-create. It could be a new venture. It could be solving problems that our community is facing. So um, I think that's probably what, you know, what would come next is, you know, co-creating something that is bigger, solve problems in the community. It can be a new, new ventures. Um, who knows, right? And I like that a lot. And that, that ties to what you were saying earlier of being unafraid to innovate, right? Mm -hmm. Because it goes trust, then innovate, right? Yes. And, and to innovate, you need to be able, you need to have a ground where you can you can fail safely. Correct. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great observation. Um, thanks for that. Um, I've enjoyed the heck out of this, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Same you're, here. You're awesome. I didn't think that we were going to go so deep into the heart, but you just like, you just yanked yeah. me in there. Um, <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about um, what what you're thinking next. You know, what's what's coming up next for you in terms of uh, something you're excited for, uh, something uh, that's a goal for you. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's really a um, great question. So there are a couple of things. <clears throat> of course, I'm looking for another opportunity, you know, uh, another organization, my next venture, uh, you know, from an employment perspective. But really to 
can you know i mean this is i see this as a good opportunity to um really give back to um the community and i want to um help other emerging leaders female leaders uh to you know up their game or to get into uh, to earn their their um, seat at the executive table. Um, we need more um, empathetic, right, voices. And I'm not saying that only females are empathetic, but just coming from my own background, I can help other, you know, leaders who um, have been passed on. You know, I went through it. I had to push my, you know, push my way up the ladder. Um, and it doesn't mean the corporate ladder just for the just for the titles, but really to create an impact, right? To 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 feel like I'm providing value, that I'm actually making a difference. So for me, the next step really is to give back, to uh, be a coach, to be a mentor, um, and uh, you know, be there for somebody like me who. Um, wants to, you know, be a better project manager or be a better leader um, and tell them, hey, you're you're not alone. You know, you don't have to go through the struggles that I I went through um, and get there faster. Oh, man, that's a well-timed tear. I promise you <laughs> what you said was actually beautiful, <laughs> but I am also tearing up from something in my throat. Um, but no... Uh, <laughs> back to you um i think it's okay to say women have superpowers <laughs> emotionally and an empathy and i would fight any dude who has an issue with that because i think we all have moms and um we know that um they they mm -hmm. tend to be the 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 more emotionally in tune one and i think it's okay to lean into that as a superpower so I, I, think I support so. you I think, so I much. I think moms get such a, you know, <laughs> they get overlooked. And there's so much to learn from uh, what we do as mothers. There's so much to learn as leaders. Because um, I think we take our moms for granted. We take parents for granted. But really, if you really think about it, that is where leadership starts. And if you... Um, if you just focus on that, if you just learn just from, you know, a few lessons just from that, you can create really, you know, cohesive, collaborative, super teams, just like, you know, a good family. I mean, if you don't have a solid family, it can, you know, really cause a lot of issues and disintegration in the community. And the same goes for any organization. 100%. And it's it's funny how it, the organization and the family unit, um, there are some places where they're very different because mm -hmm. you can't fire someone in your family. Yeah. You kind of can, but really can't. Right. Um, but then in a lot of ways, it's like a brand of leadership that's based more on, on nurturing, care, listening, empathy, mm -hmm. and trust. And um, that's not to say that men, men can and don't do those things. Um, they certainly do. Yeah. But I think we'd all be silly if we don't recognize that um, uh, ladies, and I know speaking about my mom, especially like she had a special superpower doing that. So mm -hmm. uh, we can attribute that to her specifically or trend I've observed is uh, I, I think it's okay to lean into that. So you're, you're out there helping ladies to do that, right? To, to, to lean into their superpower and, mm -hmm. and to bring it into an organization. Um yeah. Any any ladies anywhere, or is there a specific um, group that you think would resonate most with your message? Um, any women leaders, emerging leaders, um, managers who um, are maybe in tech or project managers. I think it's right now I'm focusing on that niche because that's where I can relate. You know, um, I can relate to the most. So any. Um, PMs or in, in technology, uh, frankly, any, you know, any female leaders who really want to uh, grow and um, 
you know, reach the next level, you can reach out to me. Awesome. And on, on that note of reaching out to you, how can people find you? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. That's the best way to, to reach me. Um, I post on a regular basis, at least a week. I want to do more. Um, so yeah, that's the best way to reach me. Just connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. We'll make sure to include that link in the notes. Shella, thanks Thank again for, for hanging out with me. This was an absolute pleasure. I learned a lot. Thank I'm you. I'm going to take a lot of trust building and empathy into the world going forward today. I'm all like, I'm all ready to, to, to <laughs> listen deeply and intently. Yep. Uh, and I think that we can all, we can all grow if we do that a little more. Thank you. Thank you. It was uh, really, I enjoyed talking to you as well. I, I think we uh, uncovered a lot of things that you made me think a lot on, you know, some, some ideas that I had never thought of, especially on what happens after building trust that that was a, a huge aha moment for me as well. So thank you. Awesome. Well, see you next time. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.